Welcome back to Almost a True Crime Podcast. I'm Madison. And I'm Taryn. And we are a lively, conversation-based true crime podcast between two best friends. We take everything seriously except for ourselves. Listener discretion is advised due to the mature content and the amount of cuss words we say. (laughs) (laughs) You've been warned. Hey. Hello. What's up, guys? How are you all? Do we have anything? I don't believe so. I accidentally titled for a brief (laughs) six hours. Part one was titled The Murder of Scott Peterson. So if you got to catch that, Sam Keller finally texted me at eight. so funny. (laughs) Like, did you mean to do this? No. It's like, absolutely not. I did not mean to do this. So that's kind of funny. Yeah. My bad. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. I typed that out. I typed the description and the title out like days ago just so I would have it ready. So it's been wrong for days. I never think about, like, <laughs> typing up my little description for you. I did one time, I think. I feel there was one case where I, like, got the pictures and everything. There was, like, one. I think it was when your grandma died. So I was, like, really doing the most. I think it was something like that, too. Like, I just wasn't around. So it takes a death for me to really step up. So <laughs> <laughs> now we know. Oh, we did speak it into existence last week. I was, in fact, exposed to COVID this week. Of course. <laughs> so. So far, so good, though. Test we is s- negative today so we far. We be so. doing a well. <laughs> Keep an eye on that. <laughs> so I literally everyone, can't believe Stay this, safe out there. This bullshit. Literally, we just talked about oh it. Oh, my God. I literally told myself today. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone heard that. That was my thigh ripping off this chair. <laughs> I told myself to put pants on before I came over here, and I forgot. You didn't do that. It's June. Like, I refuse to wear pants. No. Or socks. Ugh. <laughs> I'm in slippers Except robe. I went full pants. I don't. I just, That's how I live my life. No. I like to walk around in as little clothing as possible so I can sit and use a blanket. I do love a nice blanket moment, though. I love using a comforter. It's, like, <sighs> all cold. Yes. Mm. Okay, let's do some new Patreons. If I miss you, it's because the app only lets me see the last five who have subscribed to us. There's no way we've gotten more than five recently. No, this is five in the past four weeks. Oh, okay. Well, then. So, four weeks ago, Joan MacArthur, if you're still here. (laughs) Thank (laughs) you. We hope you are. Also from Canada, I think. (gasps) I want to go to Canada. So, So do I. Please let us know if Canada is as magical as Americans fantasize it to be in our heads. Right. In my head, it's, it's the perfect place. It's the promised land. It is the promised land. Straight up Handmaid's Tale. If I make it to Canada. I'm good. I'm oh fine. Oh, my God. I should rewatch The Handmaid's Tale. But then I think it also will scare me if I watch it currently. Yeah. Like it is. You're in danger. Things are just lining up a little too much for my liking. <laughs> and then four weeks ago, we had Liani. Why does that sound familiar? I'm not sure. But the little symbol next to the dollar is like a euro symbol. Oh. So this may be overseas, <gasps> which we also fantasize about. Oh, my Where God. Where are you from? I've never left the country. The farthest place I've gone is California. That's pretty fucking far. LA. In your defense. <laughs> when we went to LA. For the Oscars. <laughs> you know what? When we start something else, that's got to be the first like story we tell. It's my go-to fun fact. Me too. And now people know it is. So people will be like, oh, Taryn went to California when I was with <laughs> Kosenka camping with her family. Her dad brought up California. She's like, Taryn's been there. I, like, I love went to LA, actually. No, that, that's exactly what we're going to say. I have very little to brag about <laughs> in my life. So let me have my small moments. Then we have Megan from three weeks ago. Hi, Megan. What's up, Megan? I think it's Megan Fox. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? I Am know, I supposed I was, to say something? No, I was trying to think of like other Megan's, Megan Markle, but it's not spelled the same. Does Megan Fox use an H? She's just oh, Megan, right? M E G A N. That's how this is spelled. Maybe it's her. So it could be. She's kind of weird. She might like us. She is kind of weird. She's different. <laughs> to say the least about it, she's different. She had to. Cut a hole in her. In the crotch of her jumpsuit. custom jumpsuit. So she could have sex with Machine Gun Kelly. That's Ugh. a sentence I never thought would exist. She just strikes me as someone who would want a big, huge, like, yeah. fucking Vin Diesel Burly man. man. Oh, like Jason Momoa and Megan Fox. That's a moment. <sighs> I would pay to watch them have sex. That was the funniest tweet that was like. It's also how I feel about 
Pete Davidson and Kim Kardashian right now, though. I My prayer in life is that a sex tape gets released of them. <laughs> but, like, she does it right this time and markets it completely. She, it's, I want it to be in her hands. Yeah. I want her to have full control over this. And but I, I want it. to see it. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Elise Lopez, who is from True Crime Cat Lawyer, who's oh. always hyping us up on Instagram. Aw. You have to look you. up True Crime Cat Lawyer. They're the greatest. I just did the other day. She posts pictures of her cat all the time. Yes. Which is my favorite thing on the planet Earth. Yes. This is true. And then our last new one is Heather. Hi, Heather. Heather R. Mm, I don't know any Heather R's. I don't think I know any Heathers, personally, honestly. Have you ever seen the Heathers? No, I have not. (gasps) You would fucking love it. It's so dark, and the fashion is amazing. Like how watching... um, Death Becomes Her changed my life. It'll be just like that. Oh, It's just a bunch of mean girls in great outfits and a bunch of murder. Oh, shit. It's really good. Have you ever watched, um, what's the one with the witches? The Craft. The Craft. I have seen The Craft. The old Craft. They redid it. I've never seen the new one. The only thing I don't like about The Craft is the part where it's all the snakes Makes me gag. <laughs> it's like gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> Snakes and things are not, it's not my, not, not my your shit. deal. No. Should we start announcing the people who left? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Let's give them a round of applause. Am- Wait. Amanda had had enough. Oh, I don't. That's okay. That's fine. I also am subscribed to some Patreons where I'm like. I'm not subscribed I don't to need any it. Patreons. Like I just need. I really want to subscribe to Chris DiStefano's because he puts out funny ass videos. But like, we're not that. So it just makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, we don't really give you much. So no. if, you've, if you've stuck around this long, <laughs> we love you. We love you. You're devoted. And if you don't stick around that long, we don't I blame understand. you. <laughs> Completely understand. But like, we for sure need a couple of you to stick around to pay the <laughs> yeah, bills it to, costs to run. The yeah, operation. exactly. So. <laughs> So don't get too comfortable. Don't think we're that okay with it. Yeah, no, I still need your If you start money. dropping like flies. This is done. This whole thing is done. This empire <laughs> we have built, it's over. Oh, also. What? I feel like we need to bring it up on the pod. Oh, we haven't brought the hot dog contest. <laughs> yes. Oh, fuck. So let's clarify I'll a few things, thing guys. Up. Okay. We have gotten some. So we've gotten some numbers. If you haven't seen, if you don't follow us anywhere, because this, was, this was a... Give me a... Oh, I thought you it. were getting into the rules, because they don't even know what it is. Some oh, people no, might not that's even... That's what I'm going to tell okay. them what it is. Passing, passing the mic. Okay. So, Mimi has to be putting down hot dogs. Okay. Favorite go-to food. It's the best. Literally, microwave, boiled, grilled I in the oven. I had fried hot dogs the other day. What? Amazing. We fried them in bacon grease when we were camping. Game changer. They got kind of crispy on the <gasps> outside. Fried hot dogs. Delicious. So anyways, so I honestly don't know how this got brought up. It was going to be just like a funny thing amongst ourselves. <laughs> and they were like, wait, no, let's like make this a thing. Let's use this for some publicity. It started because you came over and you had had two hot dogs for dinner that day. Yeah, you're right. Which is a go-to dinner for me in the summertime. Um, so the competition is not to see who can eat the most hot dogs individually. No. You have to guess. You. Because <laughs> I me. would win. Yeah. I would win. I just can't get enough of them. Um, so collectively, we're asking people to guess mm-hmm. from June 1st to September 1st. Yep. How many hot dogs me and Madison collectively can eat? Yeah. No, not collectively. I thought it was collectively. I want separate guesses. Oh, do you? Yeah. I thought you said it was us together. Well, I meant like... I don't want people to pick between us. I want people to pick right. both. I want the them. whole amount of what they think me and you are combined eating. No, separate. Separately, though. Not a combined number. They yeah. think we're each going to eat X amount. Yes. Okay. Okay. That way we can have multiple winners. Whoever's closest to me and whoever's closest to you. Okay. Okay. So I didn't know the rules. <laughs> so I'm glad I explained this to you guys. So you're going to guess how many hot dogs you think Madison is going to eat? How many hot dogs you think I am going to eat? Yes. And then whoever is closest, I'm going to say without going over, I feel like that's what Mm -hmm. the rules are, Mm -hmm. will get some type of free merch. Yeah, we're going to whip up something special. Yeah. Hopefully hot dog themed. It has to be. So. 
So that is the hot dog contest. I will throw up another poll on Instagram yeah. for you to vote on our Instagram stories. Yeah, we need to streamline and how we're I bringing in these numbers. And I do want to say, post. I think the people that have already voted or have already put in their numbers, you should probably put in. You can re-guess. Yeah, re-guess. Because I need you to know that Taryn's sister, who also <laughs> loves hot dogs as much yes. as we do, no more, no less, ate 11 hot dogs in a week. Yeah, I Just think so I'm know. up to eight. I have since three last I've week. Three hot dogs so, since last week. Just so you guys know, up, rough average. Up your numbers. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's all I'm going to say. I'm not even going to tell you any more about the amount of hot dogs I'm eating. But it's a high number, and this is just getting started. And just so you know, I eat all beef Hebrew National hot dogs, so they're kosher. <laughs> so I, I'm not eating the fake plastic pig lips that everyone says are the other hot dogs. I, I eat all beef. Probably am. Yeah, I just can't. After I love I've a had bun length Oscar Mayer wiener. See, but you can get the beef ones that are bun length, and they're so much juicier. Mm. You know, I don't like that. I like my food dry. You're right. As hell. You're right. You do. What if we did like a Tony Paco shirt for the winner? Oh, that that'd your brother be nice. That oh, he... my God. My brother lives in Oregon. <laughs> Oregon. The state. No, he doesn't. He used to. He lives in fucking Arizona. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Where am I? Um, the other day he sends me this text and he said, oh, my God, you have got to try Tony Paco's pickle and peppers. Have you ever <laughs> heard of them? I was like, you know I'm from Toledo, right? Like, Born here. The original Tony Paco's is less than five miles from <laughs> my home. Yes, I have had said pickles and peppers. There's a jar currently in my fridge. He said, oh my, his mind is fucking blown. It's like, that's a Toledo thing. So he funny. said, oh my God, they serve them at, the, or they have them at the store or whatever yeah. out there. I'm like, that's weird we for can you. We go sit down and eat them. I'm like, they fry I, them. I, oh, <laughs> I fucking My love them. My favorite. That's what made me realize I loved fried pickles. Same. Tony Paco's pickles. But fried banana peppers. So fucking good. Unmatched with their fucking, oh, I also buy the Tony Paco spicy ketchup. Sweet and spicy ketchup. Ooh. Oh. Is it good? Yeah, they have it at Kroger. It's so good. Okay. It's so, so that's good with we'll the do. fried pickles or like, uh, like crispy fries. Oh, shit. So good. Okay. So, yeah. So, that's what's going on. That's the hot dog thing. <laughs> if you like to participate. And it doesn't guess, matter because I'm still going to keep eating hot dogs anyways. Yeah, we're not changing our lives for this. We're just making this, this fun. Yeah, we're no. just trying to make it fun for you guys. I'm eating no more or no less hot dogs. This is a completely <laughs> average. <laughs> yeah. And I say it's just summer, but I eat hot dogs like this all of the time. It's just increased during the summer because I can grill them. Yeah, and it's hot and nothing else sounds good I except don't a cook. hot dog. Okay, we can get started. We had really nothing to say in yeah, I know. And 14 then minutes of bullshit. I was thinking about it today, that we needed to talk about the hot dog thing. Don't forget, well, it's too late now if you've listened to all these minutes, but I will put in the description when we actually start talking about shit. So you can avoid <laughs> so all So next this. time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you remember in part one, we left off with a call coming into the tip line from a woman named Amber Fry. Oh, yeah. Okay, Amber 30th. Fry. Yes. Okay, and that's, okay, gotcha. Chris Watts, Amber Fry. Yes. Blah, 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 blah. If okay. you're familiar with this case, you know exactly where I'm going. So, she introduces herself on the tip line as Scott's girlfriend. She was immediately deemed credible due to the fact that she had specific dates they had been together and could show phone calls that they have had since Lacey went missing. Again, like other women, Amber had no idea Scott was married. And it somehow gets worse than that in a few minutes. Okay. So just buckle up. So, upon seeing Scott on the news in relation to his missing wife, she has no idea he's he's married. He's never mentioned any of this. She just sees her boyfriend on the news and his oh wife is God. missing. What the fuck would you... I would lose my mind. I would, I would throw kill up. him. I think I would kill him. <laughs> or, actually, I don't know. Like, what? Yeah, we would never know. Like, your know. whole world is completely just fucked up now. Yeah. Like, you are in a relationship with this man. Wild. She said they started seeing each other on November 20th, 2002, Jordan's oh. birthday. So it was a fairly newer relationship. Yeah, only five weeks before Lacey okay. went missing. Very new. She said they talked on the phone every day since then. Scott again told Amber he had never been married. And then a few weeks later, on December 9th, he broke down and confessed that he had been married, but his wife had died, and this would be his <sighs> first Christmas without her. 
First of all, why did this man ever get married? I have no idea. I still don't understand. I don't understand either. Now, when he's when he's telling her this, this is December 9th, 9th, Lacey is not dead or missing yet. Very much alive in his life. Yeah. Lights went off in the detective's head, first of all, because what the fuck? And second of all, the same day Scott broke down sobbing to Amber about it, being his first holiday without his wife, was the same day he bought the boat that they believe he used to dispose of Lacey's body. Hmm. They immediately scheduled an interview with Amber to see if she would help them. The next day, they were at Amber's house at 11 a.m. She showed police a Christmas gift from Scott that was delivered to her on December 26th. Three wine corks they had that they had saved from their dates, which had the actual dates and their names written on them. Like, they're very much dating. Like, they're doing That's these cute like things. like a thoughtful, yeah. Yeah. Which is, like, so cute, but Scott is a derp also. It's, like, mm-hmm. not cute. She also handed them a formal invitation for a Christmas party that they had attended together on December 14th and the receipt for the tuxedo Scott had rented for the party. How does this man get away with this? I don't fucking know. You're going to full on, like, uh, what's Facebook not a thing? I, no, I don't, uh, I don't think so. He's the kind of person that wouldn't have one. No, they're going, like, to events together. Yeah. Formal like, events. He's running tuxedos. What the fuck? She then handed a thing of condoms over that would have his fingerprints on it and a Christmas gift that she had planned to bring for him. Then they did a taped interview. They first interviewed Amber's friend, Sean, who was a woman, who was there and who was actually the first person to meet Scott. She met Scott on a business trip where he asked her what he should write on his name tag to attract women. Again, he's very much married at this point. Lazy's very pregnant. They spent all day together drinking. They stayed out drinking for so long that security told them, like, they had to leave. Been there. He ended up writing HB on his name tag, which stood for horny bastard. <laughs> what the fuck? He's the worst. The worst person. They then talked all night in the hallway when she said she would introduce him to her friend Amber. Um, Sean is engaged, by the way. So she, like, has a man. And he, I don't remember where I put it, but he was, like, very creepy towards her, too. Like, this sounds, like, like very inappropriate it was, on both parts super inappropriate so she says she'll introduce him to amber mostly because they had like gotten away from the creepy stuff and they've mm-hmm. gotten into some like deep conversations about finding the one true person you're supposed to spend your life with because he said he thought he found the one but it didn't work out and he was looking for someone intelligent okay i want to punch him so he's calling his wife an idiot yeah However, early December, after him and Amber had already been together, Sean learned that Scott might actually be married. Remember, they met through, like, a work-type thing, so she doesn't really know who he is. Right. Like, she didn't directly know him. She knew people who knew him, something like that. So she calls him on December 6th and was like, hey, I just heard some guy who's going to work for your company say that you were bragging that you made so much money that your wife just bought a house in Modesto. And, of course, he denied the whole thing. He's like, no, 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 because he's the fucking worst. Right. Then, of course, he called her back and explained that he wasn't currently married. He had lost his wife and it had been really hard and to please not tell Amber because he wanted to tell her himself. So on December 9th, he called called Sean back to say that Amber knew everything, which was when he told Amber that Lacey had died. So he really probably only told her because he thought this other girl was going to tell her he was married. Absolutely. Then Amber gives her interview. They talked to Matt for the first time on November 20th. They went out to a bar in Fresno for their first date. He gets to the bar and tells Amber that he had been in a suit all day and he wanted to go check into his hotel and change and shower before dinner. Which is wild. Why would you show up to dinner and then be like, I want to do all of these things before we eat dinner? Yeah, what the fuck? I feel like you need to get fucking real. So she went with him and when they got to his room, he had already had a bottle of champagne chilling, like ready to go. Oh my God. Yeah, so he knew what he was doing. Yeah, what the fuck? They drank and then went to dinner. Scott had gotten them a private room at a Japanese restaurant. They had another bottle of champagne and talked. Scott allegedly talked about how about all of his travels to Africa and Spain and how for Thanksgiving he would be in Alaska with his father and brother. For Christmas he would be in Maine and then on December 28th he would be in Paris until the end of January. So he's already setting up this timeline. So like, won't be here, won't be here, won't be here. Because he's spending the holidays with his wife, wife. and family. Yeah. Or planning something much worse. Right. She then talked about her daughter, Ayana. She has a daughter. They stayed in the private room talking until the restaurant closed. They then went back to the hotel and they did sleep together that first night. Scott said he would be traveling for work and the two talked on the phone for a few 
a few times until he took time to go to her house on December 2nd. He was excited to meet her daughter, and they went and picked her up together from school. What the fuck? She's really, uh... He's all in on this. Yeah. She went quick. When struggling to get her car seat in his truck, he made a comment how awful it was that his car wasn't even baby-proof. Because in reality, he was literally about to have his own child. Because Lacey's yeah. very pregnant at this point. They went to a park, and she said Scott seemed so happy, but for some reason, when Ayana reached out to hold his hand, he wouldn't hold it. Amber said that Scott maybe had arthritis or something. Like, just making... <laughs> It's actually kind of funny. She actually said that she thought Scott maybe had rigor mortis. What is that? <laughs> when dead bodies get stiff. What? But she meant arthritis, but she accidentally <laughs> said rigor mortis. <laughs> what the fuck? Isn't that funny? I, I don't, don't even know what that is. How's that pop to your head? <laughs> I don't That's know. hilarious. They then went back to Amber's house, and Scott gave Ayana a pop-up night before Christmas book, which... I don't know if I said it in the first part or if I cut it out. Him, Scott and Lacey were shopping at Barnes and Noble for kids books together right before he did this. So they think that he bought this book when he was with Lacey to give to Amber's daughter. This guy is something else. Yeah. They talked about Amber's birthday, which was Lacey's due date, which is wild. He stayed the night at her house that night. They slept together again. He picked up her daughter from school when Amber was at work. And when Amber got home, Scott had Ayana in her high chair ready to eat. The table was set. Wine was out. He had cut in the bread with the pesto already on it. Like, he did everything. He's really living this playing house. He's playing house when he has a family. This is insane. She truly thought the perfect man had, like, waltzed into her life. Right. Which should have been (laughs) your fucking first clue. Then, of course, on December 9th, he went to her home to tell her about his wife, which Amber was understanding, basically saying, like, I get it. You don't want to just tell everyone you meet that your wife had just passed away. They then continued on as normal because she has no reason to not believe him at yeah. this point. Well, fuck so, yeah, especially. He's, and you're not going to, like, make a big deal about him not saying his wife had died because. Maybe he doesn't want to talk about it. Right. Yeah. And it's so fresh. They went to two parties together, a birthday party for Sean's fiance on the 11th, who, if you remember, introduced them, and the formal Christmas party together on the 14th. They had been intimate several more times, Scott revealing to Amber that he had a vasectomy when Amber asked why he didn't want to have children. What? Had he had a vasectomy? I don't think so. Because he blowing lows in this girl? Maybe. Oh my god. Which that's illegal, I think. Blowing loads? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope not. <laughs> Um, or I have some reports to make. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think you can't tell someone you've had a vasectomy. When you have it. Yeah. And then just, it's like that's, having sex. That's like sex. a consensual thing. Yeah, it's like knowingly having an STD and not telling yeah. someone and then not using protection. Yeah, so he reveals to Amber that he had a vasectomy. So arrest him now, because he's lying. Should have, this should end here. <laughs> should end here. When Amber asked that he didn't want to have children, he said no if we're being together, I can only think of one child, and that is Ayana. Oh, my God. Lacey is pregnant with his son, and he's telling Amber that Ayana is the only child he can think of. Amber did say that Scott being so young and already having had a vasectomy was a little weird to her. Like, she does say that was a moment where she sort of looked like, that's kind of fucking weird. Yeah, it is. Because he is pretty young at this point. They talked on the phone a few more times that month, Scott saying he was traveling for business. On the 23rd, he talked to Amber again, saying he was in Maine. Also, she doesn't know where he lives. Guess not. Like, or it was just far enough away that she didn't. I'm like, what the f- You wouldn't like, eh, whatever. So on the 23rd, he talked to her again, saying he was in Maine. We know he was not. He was getting Correct. his hair cut with Lacey. On the 24th, he didn't call Amber at all. Obviously, Lacey yes. went missing that day. On the 25th, he called Amber twice, once in the morning and once at night, the day after his wife was missing. She said she could hear a woman in the background and Scott asking her to not come sit by him right now, which I can only assume was probably Lacey's mom yeah. or his own mom or one of his sisters. On the 27th, he called her again saying he would be getting on his flight to Europe in the morning. She called him on the 28th around 4 p.m., not expecting his phone to work, assuming he's in Paris because I don't know how like international things worked. Yeah. When he answered, he explained he missed his 
flight in the morning, but he was in New York waiting for the next flight. Amber was upset that he hadn't called her earlier. He apologized and then started talking about their future holidays together. Like, I know we're not together for these holidays, but... Like, ne- this time next year. He brings up a lot to Amber about the end of January, sort of being like, when January's over, we can really start our lives together. Very specific. Very fucking weird. Also, yeah. he's definitely not in New York on his way to Paris. He was at... Right. Amber and her friend Denise decided to finally Google Scott that night on December 28th. Finally. Finally. Oh my God. The first thing you fucking see. This is how she found out what was going on. All the articles popped up about Scott Peterson's wife missing. And I'm pretty sure he was already not looking that great in the media at that point. Oh my God. So she contacted the police to see if it was the same Scott Peterson. Like she's still thinking maybe this is not it. It's not like, it wouldn't be crazy for there to be another Scott Peterson. No. But. <laughs> it's all right. Oh, all the clues. <laughs> so that's on the 28th. She finally calls the police on the 30th. They figure all this shit out. Scott called Amber on New Year's Eve, still clinging to this lie, telling her he was standing by the Eiffel Tower and there were fireworks <laughs> and the crowds were huge. He's all in on this lie. Which is why the sociopath thing comes up so much. Yeah. Because how can you how easily can you lie that? about this shit? Of course, Amber now knows that he's lying. Yeah. And just she's just stringing him along. She's basically working with the police right. at this point. Oh, yeah. He tells her he can't really hear her, but he loves her, and he'll call her when it's New Year's Eve, her time, which is the same time. They're in the same time zone. Like, he's that far into this lie that he's trying How to look up. How could you think that? Yeah. Not me. No. So what was really going on on New Year's Eve, when Scott was in this alleged large crowd where he couldn't hear Amber... Scott was at a candlelight vigil for Lacey with him, Lacey, and his own parents and more than a thousand attendees, which again, very much gone girl to me. I can't believe she so. denies pulling even a little from this. She yeah. she didn't. Liar. Amber wasn't there like the other mistress, but yeah, yeah, he's just talking oh to God, her. I need to rewatch Gone, gone Girl. Gone what girl. is this accent I have today? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> If you're on the Patreon, you know what she's talking about. She did this for a full 27 minutes. I don't get it. (laughs) So, yeah. He avoided going to the cameras. He did not go on stage with the rest of the family, who were making pleas for everyone to keep searching for Lacey. He's calling his girlfriend this whole time. Talking about being by the Eiffel Tower. Scott did call Amber back at midnight her time, which was also his time. He just called her at midnight. Yeah, that's easy. Easy math. Yep. The call lasted about 70 minutes. Jesus Christ. Yeah, where Amber asked him about their future, about raising Ayana, and importantly got dates from him of when he would be traveling and when he would be back. Because that's really what the police wanted her to get out of him at this point. So now he's like, he's telling her when he's not going to be around. So now they're like, if he's like leaving anywhere, we need to know. The next day, the detectives went back to Amber's while she called him. Again, he weaved the super elaborate lie about how cold it was and how he was going jogging and how there was a dog barking all day and he wanted to kill it. Which was his own dog. It was Mackenzie. Because she can hear the dog. She told them he had a P.O. box he made her use to send him mail. Oh, see? That's how she didn't know where he fucking lived. (laughs) Yeah. Someone gives me a P.O. box to (laughs) mail to them. I. That's so weird to me. Unless it's like... Okay, I did used to live somewhere where you had to use a P.O. box, but it was, like, the tiniest little yeah. fucking town. That's why. The detectives also followed up on all of Scott's lies about work. He told them when he was really with Amber. So Scott's saying, like, oh, I was at work that weekend, I was at work that weekend. He's with Amber all of those Amber, days. Yeah. Also, on New Year's Day, the police got a break in the burglary, burglary across the street. But the more they got out of the guy, the more it was becoming clear he didn't have anything to do with Lacey. Just, like, yet another... <laughs> random burglary in this yeah. neighborhood they were also we're still dealing with tips and the tip line from the red lion hotel so they're just getting like a bunch of shit someone there did say that scott appeared to have a breakdown on the 30th and was sobbing and also scott's eyes did well up in front of the detectives when he was asking about the probability of Lacey being alive still so he is showing some emotion at least at certain points of this whole thing hmm. Then, still New Year's Day, the police got him to the station under the pretense that they are releasing Lacey's car to him. Which, I mean, they were releasing Lacey's car to him, but they also had a warrant for his DNA. Hell yeah. And they are going to tell him about Amber. So they purposely showed Scott 
a sort of grainy photo of him and Amber. He, of course, said, he said, is that supposed to be me? Said it wasn't him, said he didn't know who the woman was. The detectives then divert his attention away from the photo and start talking about the anchor again and why he chose to make an anchor rather than just buy one. Scott said that cement was $3 and an anchor was $30, and the man who sold him the boat did not want to sell him the anchors with it, which is confirmed in a second interview with Bruce. He would not sell him the anchors with the boat. So he's like, I'm just going to make my own for cheaper. Who would think that a boat wouldn't come with an anchor? I don't know. That is kind of weird. Do boats typically come with anchors? I don't know shit about boats. Me neither. I wish I did. Yeah, same. (laughs) It's not a life I'm accustomed to right now. Me neither. They then circle back, like, listen, we know you have a job that requires you to travel. You're a good-looking man. If you have a girlfriend, it doesn't mean you did anything to Lacey. Again, Scott denied everything, said he never cheated on Lacey. Meanwhile, the detectives are currently on the phone with Janet, who we know he dated in college while he was married to Lacey. That night, Lacey's mother and Scott's parents were on CNN's Larry King Live with none other I hate Larry King. than Nancy Grace. Ugh. Nancy Grace is wild. I prefer Nancy Grace to Larry, <laughs> Larry King. King. If you don't know who Nancy Grace is, she's got a Long Island medium haircut. The Didn't biggest... Larry King just die? Yeah. Okay, I thought so. Biggest Wait, fucking hair. I have him. I'm confusing him with someone else. I'm confusing him with David Letterman. You hate David Letterman? David, have you seen like old clips of David Letterman no, doing interviews? Not. He was a little fucking bastard. <laughs> Anyway, Nancy's just fucking loud and obnoxious. Dude, she is fucking wild. I have engraved in my head from watching so much Nancy Grace during Kaylee, Casey Anthony. Yeah. Hot top mom. like hot, The just, hot top mom. Just over and over. And I it's, just... She, you know what? Google, YouTube some... If you Nancy, don't know Nancy. who Nancy Grace is, yeah. there's... Have you seen that one that I want to do where, like, this guy's son was missing... And they found out, like, while she's interviewing him on air that he was in his basement, like he had been found. Do you remember no. that? Okay, don't look it up, because it sounds like a good one then. <laughs> okay, anyway, Nancy spent the segment talking about how um, Scott cooperated to an extent and whether or not he would take a polygraph test yet. Lacey's mom stated the two arrests were made in relation to the burglary, and Scott's father ended the story by saying Scott being implicated is a non-issue. So they're all doing this interview. Everyone is still sort of backing Scott at this point because they don't know. They also don't know about Amber yet. They haven't alerted Scott's family. And Scott's dad is basically saying Scott is being looked at, but it's not a big deal because nothing's going to come from it. By January 4th, Scott was under 24-hour surveillance. The detectives also interviewed Karen Service, who found Mackenzie that morning. And Lacey's brother, Brent, who said he thought Lacey was abducted for weird sexual reasons or for the baby. Or maybe something happened to her because she was vocally opposed to some street project in the neighborhood that was going on. So he's still very much in Scott's corner. He's like, she could have been kidnapped for several reasons. Yeah. She could have had enemies from this weird little block party type fucking street deal. They also interviewed Amy Roca, Lacey's half-sister, who... Cut Scott's hair the day before Lacey went missing. That night, Scott called Amber again to tell her he was leaving for Madrid in the morning. Still just fuck. She's known for a week He's now. just a fucking jet setter, ain't he? Yeah. Yeah, how could you do that? Like, how could you know this and play it off like you don't? Absolutely oh, not. The Madrid. anger in my stomach. I'd be, I would be fuming able to. pissed. January 5th, detectives did several more interviews with people close to Lacey and Scott. All had pretty much the same consensus. Consensus. <laughs> consensus. Why are you talking seductively? I don't know. <laughs> Nothing indicated that Scott was violent towards Lacey, but his attitude and actions around this time were a little off. It's basically what everyone's saying. Like, we don't think Scott had anything to do with it. Scott and Lacey never fought, but he is acting weird as fuck. Huh. There's also a call from Scott's father about a satanic cult in the area that sacrificed babies. Always. Always. Satanic panic. The police did follow up on that. Not a whole lot came of it. The address he gave was a business, and nobody there had ever even heard of the cult he brought up. What the fuck? The cult and the satanic panic stuff comes up in trial. This came up a lot in that super biased book for Scott Peterson. Oh, God. I don't think I include it just because it's so very clearly not what happened. Right. Even if Scott had nothing to do with it, it wasn't this. Yeah. So I don't feel the need to talk about it. Yeah. A more realistic tip 
came from a woman named Kristen Dempwolf, who was also eight and a half months pregnant, who was walking East Loma Park around 8.45 to 9 a.m. and did not recall seeing Lacey there. She got home and recalled seeing Scott loading his truck around 9.40 a.m. They make a big deal out of this because he was supposed to be gone allegedly by 9.30. Mm -hmm. She also recalls seeing a white van on the street at that time. There were also other witnesses who recall seeing this white van on the street. I do not believe Scott ever brought up seeing the white fan. He never brought up that this was on the street when he was leaving. They also allude to foul play because of this, alleging that Scott worked with the white van to get rid of Lacey. So that's why he didn't bring it up. Or he was so distracted with loading Lacey's body in the bed of the truck that he didn't even notice there was another van in the street. Both plausible. Agreed. Over these two days, police followed Scott using a tracker they put on his car. They followed him to a marina where a official police search dive was going on for Lacey, but he never got out to help or talk to the searchers. He just sort of drove down there and scoped it out and then left. He never got out and was like, how's it going? Do you need help? None none of the sort. Hmm. They also followed him to a meetup with a man where they briefly talked, allegedly maybe exchanged money. Hmm. They obviously think this man is his accomplice right. to whatever was going on. Then on January 5th and 6th, Things start to explode with Amber. On the fifth, Amber she can't do this anymore. <laughs> On the fifth, Amber calls him that her friend left her some frantic message about needing to talk to her and that she would call her when she got off her flight and that she was worried about her. Amber was referring to the fact that this case was now in People magazine, picked up in a nationwide magazine. Oh Jesus! Scott acted like he had no idea what her friend could be calling to talk to her about. He's like, I have he no has idea. to be seeing this shit. Like, you, in his head, he doesn't think, you know what, I should probably say something. He is delusional. Clearly. Like, you, at some point, you got to realize this woman has access to, like, you know, the media. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's, it's a big deal. He's something else. Then, on January 6th, while Amber was in a taped room with detectives, Scott called her and fessed up that he was married and that they think he had something to do with the disappearance of his wife. Jesus, no way. <laughs> what? Can you, like, how do you even pretend? Yeah, like, I know you moron. Fucking idiot, I see it everywhere. He's so stupid. He said he only lied about traveling, and he meant everything he said to her. He was very sorry, but he was trying to protect her, and he would explain everything. She directly asked why he told her his wife died and why he was talking about this was his first holiday without her. He had no explanation for that. Or he was not willing to talk about that with her. Mm -hmm. This phone call went on for like 90 minutes of him basically telling Amber that he loved her and he couldn't explain anything to her. He was like, I just can't explain. Yeah, because you got caught in a million lies you thought you would never be caught in. Right. The big thing they got out of this was a taped recording of Scott admitting to Amber on December 9th that his wife had passed away. <sighs> Huge. Oh, okay. He does admit that he told her on right. December 9th yeah. that his wife died. There was also, obviously, a lot of gaslighting. Like, I didn't say exactly that. I didn't say she was missing. I didn't say tragedy. Whatever. Which yeah. he obviously did. You said she clearly was not around. He also alluded to the idea that maybe Connor wasn't even his. He talked about the baby literally as little as possible, changing the yeah, subject like, as often as he could. I forget she was pregnant. Yes, a whole ass baby. He ended the conversation by saying he predicts that they will find Lacey with her baby, never his, her baby. Huh. The next day, Amber called and insisted that Scott take the polygraph test, to which Scott replied that he already did. <gasps> He's lying. Which Why does he keep lying? A lie. So she demanded his results and also wanted the number to his attorney, to which Scott said his attorney already knew about her, which was another lie. His lawyer still doesn't know he had a fucking girlfriend. He is not doing himself any goddamn favors. Not a single one. The day after that, Amber called him after he missed his noon deadline. She, like, set a deadline, like, I need these results by noon. And she said she's going to the police. He called her back and said that he did call her. Gaslight Fuck Central. Fuck my He's Jesus. like, I did call you. No, you didn't. And then went on to say that Lacey knew about Amber and he told Lacey about Amber after their first date. Which cannot be true. Definitely but not true. he was true. adamant. And then he continued to say he couldn't tell her anything else. He, like, will not tell her anything. The, uh, goodbye. Your wife is missing and you won't tell me anything. He's like, I can't explain any of this to No. Me. Can't explain. Can't explain. Like, well, all the lies. He's like, I got. 
can't I don't know. go any further about that. Monday, January 13th, police received a tip that the National Enquirer was planning to run a story about Scott having a girlfriend and other de- details of the case that made him not look so great. Police were also concerned Amber was entertaining the idea of reconciling with Scott as she had two unrecorded phone calls with him and requested to move back home because she had been staying somewhere else with the detectives for her own safety. She was supposed to be recording all her phone calls with him. She had two that she did not record with him. That night, Scott and Lacey's parents did a television appearance where they all publicly backed Scott saying how distraught he was. Oh my God, how? They still don't know he they has a girlfriend. They don't know about this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On January 15th, the the detectives decided to get ahead of the story and tell Scott and Lacey's parents about Amber before they (sighs) see it in the fucking grocery store or something. Oh, God. So they call in Lacey's parents, and when they reveal this information, Lacey's mom just starts sobbing, and she says he didn't have to kill her. (gasps) So this is the first time we see Scott lose his support. Oh, yeah. She immediately is like, he killed her. Yes. He has a whole girlfriend, and he killed Lacey to be with her. Scott's father was also pretty floored. Um, he had no idea about Amber, and he couldn't believe Scott would be having an affair. They clearly didn't know about the past. Janet and Kathy. Yeah. However, Lee maintains that this, this does not mean Scott is guilty of anything to do with Lacey. He's basically like, this is bad, it doesn't look great, but there's no way he killed Lacey still. He's not believing it. More fallout from this was the search center for Lacey at the Red Lion was shut down. The people running it thought that it would be too hard and counterproductive with Scott being there. Now that people know that he's a slime ball. Yeah. The detective entered in his report that Lacey's family was under the impression now that Scott had killed Lacey and they were hope- only hoping to find her body at this point. They've given up all hope. They're like, we're looking for yeah. her body. We know this now. There's also talks of trying to close off funds they accrued so Scott could no longer access them because they'd obviously gotten tons of donations. Right. January 16th, 2003, the National Enquirer article came out and Scott was on hella damage control. Did they name Amber or no? No. Oh, they did not name God. Amber, but they did include photographs of them. Oh. So if they know, if you knew Amber, you knew yeah. Amber. But they did not put her in, so strangers didn't know who that was. The detectives were with Lacey's mom, Sharon, that morning with a tape recorder waiting for Scott to call once the news broke. Because, again, he doesn't know that they know. He called her that morning asking why the volunteer center was closed. And she said, well, everyone was devastated that you have a girlfriend. He completely yeah. denied it. What? And, yeah, and he actually said it was some insane police theory out to get him. Oh. He's my. like, I don't have a girlfriend. That's something they made up to, like, trap me. However, when Lacey's brother called, he did admit to an encounter with the girl and just complained about the article in general, saying that, like, giving other details. He's just complaining about everything else. Like, the whole article is stupid. Yeah, maybe I saw this girl, whatever. He maintained he had nothing to do with the disappearance, and neither did Amber. Brent seemed to have more patience with Scott. Lacey's brother, Brent, he did seem to sort of cling to Scott's innocence a little longer than everyone else did, giving him some type of benefit of the doubt. Someone who did not was Sharon, Lacey's Mm -hmm. mom. She called him back and laid into him, demanding he tell her where he put Lacey's body because she deserves to bury her daughter. She called him disgusting, a liar. She said nobody wants to see his face. Lacey's dad basically got on the phone at one point and basically said all the same stuff to him, like, listen, you're disgusting. We want to bury our daughter. You did something to her, you need to tell us where you put her. Like, it's all over, Scott. Yeah. You need to just own up to it. After that phone call, Scott called Brent again and was basically like, I cannot lose any more family members. And Brent was still pretty calm. He was like, listen, they think you did it. The police are saying you did it. They're 99.9% sure that you did this. He started to say, like, the evidence is just really piling up against you. He's like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know what more. I'm lost. I want my sister back. I'm here for you now. But things are looking bad. Who could stay level-headed like that? I don't know. I don't know if he was, like, maintaining hope or if he was just trying to keep him close. Yeah. Keep your enemies close. But I don't know. In such a high emotional situation, if you would be thinking logically like that. But... It is easy to forget that, like, they had been together for so long. Like, Mm -hmm. that really is your family. Yeah. Like, that's your brother at a certain point. Detectives also got two concerned phone calls. One was from Lacey's mom saying a volunteer at the event center was talking to Scott, and he was inquiring about selling his house. He said he did not want Lacey to come back to the same environment. But, like we saw in Susan Cox Powell, it is extremely odd that someone would move houses when someone else is missing. Right. Because the first place she's going to go is there. 
And then, what, she's going to be welcomed by strangers? Yeah, and nobody is there. The second phone call was from Scott's neighbor, Kim, who was watching Mackenzie, said Scott had called her that he was going out of town for a week. So, like, okay, where are you going? <laughs> I don't think you should be doing that. I don't think you should go anywhere. Near the end of January... Amber Fry's alibi was examined, and it was checked out that she definitely was not involved in anything that happened to Lacey, which kind of sucks. I never thought she had anything to do, but it sucks that they had to do that. Oh, absolutely. Amber still tried to get Scott to take the polygraph, and he would agree and then change his mind just like he did before. He's telling, like, I'll take it. And then, like, the next day, he's, like, making up some fucking excuse. He was also still trying to talk to Lacey's mom. He called her to vent his frustrations that he was having trouble opening up a volunteer center. Again, Lacey's mom was like, give it up. Like, like nobody wants to help you. No one you believes you. Because we all know you know where Lacey is. We don't need a fucking search party. You just need to tell everyone where her body is. She flipped like a switch. Oh, yeah. I can't. I just can't imagine lying about something for that long. Like, how? When you how? know, people know. She's like. Aren't you, s- like, terrified? Don't you want it all to just end? Like, how do you think this is? How do I just want, how do you picture this ending? Like, exactly. It's not just going to blow over. It's not something they're just going to forget about. No, he's clinging to these lies. The mayor, then, for some reason, said they were suspending the search for Lacey because they did not believe her body would be found. Damn. By this point, they had searched a lot of bodies of water. Like, they've been searching the water for Lacey's body. So then the detectives had to go console Lacey's family, who Mm -hmm. heard that on the news, like, did a press conference, didn't alert anybody that they... We're not looking for Lacey anymore because they didn't think she could be found. How the fuck do you get rid of a body like that? Like, I just don't understand it. Mm. Do they ever find her body? You're going to find out. Okay. (sighs) So the detectives then had to go console Lacey's family. They had to tell them that that's not true. They don't know why the mayor said that. They're still actively (sighs) looking for Lacey. Brent also turns against Scott at this time. Finally. I know. Scott calls Brent to let him know that a search center will be opening up in L.A., and Brent replies by asking Scott if he knows what a sociopath is. (laughs) He's like, do you know what a sociopath is? Because you, sir. What the fuck are you talking about, a search center in L.A.? And then he's finally just like, just tell me what you did with her. Yeah. Like, just tell me what you did. He also focuses on the fact that Scott retained an attorney, and I may be in the minority here, but I don't think that's odd. If I were in the same shoes to someone similar to Scott and the police started prodding into me like I was a suspect immediately, yeah. I would get an attorney immediately. Yes. Same. Not because I'm guilty, but it has become shown that police will do anything to exactly. make you guilty. You're not. And I don't know what to not say to not get myself exactly. trapped like that. So I definitely <laughs> would need an attorney. An attorney will stop that in its tracks. Yes. Like we're going no further with this. Not saying Scott was doing this for innocent reasons, but in general, right. that's not at all concerning to me. Yeah. And I would do it too. Yep. And you would do it too for a check. For sure. <laughs> Another very bizarre thing that happened that's not related. On January 19th, Scott returned home to see that his house had been burglarized. Another <laughs> fucking house on the street. <laughs> this is not a safe neighborhood. No, but also who would target that house right now? Are you watching the news? <laughs> I'll tell you who. Oh, God. I get into it. So Kim McGregor, who watches Mackenzie, said that when she went to feed Mackenzie, she saw the side door was open. Well, it turns out it was Kim who robbed him. <laughs> the dog watcher <laughs> robbed Scott. <laughs> She's like, fuck you, you murdering bastard. So they then had to deep dive into Kim. They had to like, allocate these resources to this now. But it was mm-hmm. determined she didn't have anything to do with the disappearance. But her behavior was weird. So she just stole from him while she was taking care of his dog? Yes. She admitted to stealing some stuff, and then it was determined that she lied about what she stole. She ended like up stealing st- Lacey's shit? Like, eh, well, she doesn't need it she anymore. She ended up stealing a video camera with footage of Lacey, and she stole Lacey's social security card. What the fuck? She admitted she had ended what? up being fascinated by the case, and she was just stealing all this shit. Like memorabilia. That's He's like lazy scary. Social security card. Yeah. Like, what were you gonna do? Go pretend to be her and be found? You're gonna like. That's like what my mind goes to. What? Yeah. Nope. Well, that's weird, and she should just be like on a list. <laughs> yeah. like, just keep an eye on her. You need to look at her. <laughs> that literally has nothing to do with the rest of this. But how fucking weird! You're gonna burn like obviously burglarize like not sneaky steal stuff. Like yeah. she had left shit a mess. She stole it. They ended up finding the video camera. Like, they know you were there. Like, a dumpster behind a building. Like, what the fuck? 
That's weird. Scott's phone had also been wiretapped for quite some time by this point. They're, like, on him all the time. And January 20th, Scott listened to the voicemails he left Lacey. So he's listening to his own voice yeah. twice and then re-saved them. So he's not, like, listening to voicemails from Lacey. He's no, listening he's to listening voicemails. to what he said. <laughs> he said to her. He's got to memorize them again. Yeah, the argument is that he's trying to keep his alibi and memory fresh about what he had said exactly. before. Yep. Scott talked to Amber that weekend about taking a polygraph test. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> so fucking over it. He said he wanted to take a clean private test and not a dirty cop one. Oh, so one where you hire the person? Yes. <laughs> he also called his parents and told them about the break-in and alluded to the fact that it might have been Lacey's family who broke in, even though at that time he already knew it was Kim. He knew it was Kim and he's telling his family it was probably They're fucking harassing Lacey's me now, family. mom and dad. Yeah, and his parents agreed, like, they thought it was Lacey's yeah. dad, stepdad, or her brother. These families are very separated at this point. Yes, it sounds No longer. Such. Not a unit. Not. United front. Yes, that's the word. No longer a unit. They're not together. In the coming days, Scott talked to a woman about putting his house on the market as soon as possible and selling it furnished. So all the stuff Lacey picked out, he's like, you can have all of it. He also inquired... About selling Lacey's Land Rover and wanting to buy a new truck. Did you see that the Watts house like went up for sale? Yes. Insane. They should have tore it down. I know. It's going to be creepy fucking people I don't think who don't know that. Like, true crime boundaries. Yeah. It's going to be a weird. Something. Yeah. What? Like amusement? Like, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Attraction. Yes. Attraction. That's what it's going to yeah. be. They should have just gotten rid of it. That's disgusting. He also talked to his half-sister, Anne, and talked about staying at her house in Berkeley while she and her husband were on vacation. He's just trying to bebop around yeah, while you're in the middle all, of a fucking all now over a the place. investigation. January 24th, 2003, Amber Fry's name went public, and it was oh, God. madness. Poor girl. Her friend had actually called into a radio station trying to defend her, but gave just enough information that it was easy for the media to narrow down Twisted who Scott's around. girlfriend were, yeah. was. So they didn't know who she was. Her friend had oh basically outed God. her by I accident. I would beat the shit out of her. Because Amber Fry was a, like a massage therapist at a very specific place in a very small, specific town. They're like, okay, well, it's Amber, is what you're saying. Oh, my God. She was immediately surrounded by the press. She... Physically could not leave work because there was no space for her to leave work. She had to call the detectives and ask what to do. They had all agreed it would be best for her to just make a statement that day to try and get everyone off her back because they just want to hear from her. Fuck you. First of all, I'm not making any kind of a statement without an attorney <laughs> or at least like a fucking someone in PR. Like, tell me what I'm supposed to say. I'm going to fuck myself over if I, I say anything. I think they eventually come get her and she makes a statement with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... She gets a police escort back to the station where she was set to speak to Lacey's parents and Lacey's friends after the statement, which is so weird to me that they let Lacey's friends have access to her. Yeah. Her family, I understand. But could you imagine? To some degree, but like this Can you imagine no. them letting me talk to Phil's girlfriend after he murdered you? Like, why are you letting me have that type of access? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and if that happened, I hope I know what you would say. Jerry Springer up in that well, bitch. But, but then again, I'm like, oh, this poor girl. What if she had no idea? Yeah. That's basically what happened. But still, um, emotions run high. They were actually very nice to her oh, when they good. met her. They even offered to let her stay with them, which she <gasps> wow. actually did stay with Lori Ellsworth because there was no way she could go home now. Yeah. So she ended up staying with Lacey's but friends. Also, like, ugh, crazy. God, this poor girl, her life really was. Like, if she... She genuinely had no idea this was going None. on. So you can't be she mad at her. She thought she found like, the perfect stepfather yeah, for her she, daughter. Yeah, she like was building a whole life. Yeah. That's sad. Lacey's mom just tried to like understand the situation. Like mm -hmm. what dates were you together? Things like that. Like trying to piece together like yeah. moments. Like what Smart was he actually doing? Yeah. Lacey's mom's going to fucking crack this case <laughs> wide open on her own. She is. Scott's mom, Jackie, laid into the police, never admitting Scott did anything wrong and spent the conversation berating them on dragging a young 28-year-old Amber into this mess and letting people attack her, which is true, but also, yeah. like, your uh, son is a fucking asshole. Yeah, exactly. He did this. He shouldn't have yeah. been doing any of this. Yeah, he dragged Amber into this, not the police. Jackie told Scott to cut off contact with Amber and maybe start shredding his documents. Oh, huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
His dad, Lee, told him that it so wasn't. His family also knows he is guilty. They're, they're like, I don't know if, they're like, you don't, at the very least, this looks very bad. You yeah. need to start making this look less bad. Just destroy anything you can that's about to make you look worse <laughs> than you already do. His dad, Lee, told him it wasn't that big of a deal. Two thirds of people have affairs and it's not bad. That's weird. Like, why? It is bad, but actually. Like you're the center of an investigation and you didn't feel the need to disclose that to police officers. No, and you were still actively trying to date Amber. It's yeah. It's not like, okay, this While needs to While your wife end. was missing. No, no, no. So it's very different than just having an affair at this point. Very different. That statistic doesn't stand here. <laughs> no. Over the next couple of days, Scott traveled to attend the Super Bowl in person. He's just going to the Super Bowl. What the fuck? Which is so expensive. And isn't your face everywhere? That's what was my thought. Scott fucking Peterson at the Super Bowl. Like, you walk in, I'm going to know who you are, and I'm probably going to call the police, because I'm going to be scared of you. And I'm probably going to throw shit at you. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Uh, he also f- made plans to finally make TV appearances on Good Morning America in 60 Minutes. So he has not talked to any press, and he's finally like, I'm going big. I'm going to talk to fucking Diane Sawyer. Then, <laughs> then the police overhear Scott's father talking to him about a trip he's taking to Mexico. Which I'm not. Um, how? <laughs> Excuse me. There I'm, is no way you are actually able to travel outside of the country right now. That's what I'm not sure. I'm not sure at this point in the investigation if that's frowned upon or like you physically can't do it because he's. They're looking at him, but he's not a suspect. Like they have nothing. I feel like at some point they have to like if someone is a person of interest, like you take their passports. That does come up. Oh, okay. The police have his passport. Okay. But this is 2003. You don't need a passport to, to get to into Mexico. Mexico. You need one to get back in. <laughs> huh. Ain't that something. It's convenient. But the idea in their minds is like Scott is actively trying to flee. Especially yeah. since the police had told Scott all evidence points toward the bay and they intend on researching it. And now he's going to Mexico. After he hears this, he's making yeah. his plans to leave. The day before Scott was going to be on Good Morning America, Lacey's mother and sister were on the show they were also on good morning america the day before what the fuck hard pass am i going after that no if i oh my (laughs) god because they're gonna go on and say how they know you did it and then you're gonna go sit with the same people yep (laughs) they (laughs) that is genius planning on good morning america it's like let's put Lacey's parents first yeah they basically said they had no idea about the fair and their support and scott had definitely dropped since finding out about amber they're like everything has changed like, they had publicly stuck up for him. Yeah. And now they're like, we have to rescind all of that. Scott's segment went just like you'd expect. Diane Sawyer's first question was, did you murder your wife? Can you picture Diane Sawyer? I love Diane I Sawyer. Love her. She is so calm. She is. She's like such a, I would love to like sit and have a cup of coffee. I feel and like talk I'd to tell Diane her my Sawyer. secrets. Oh, she has well, that kind of face. If anyone's going to get it, because I believe that she's going to keep it. She's not. She's a reporter. Yeah. But, like, I would trust She's her. She's going to have my best interests. <laughs> I'd trust her. her with everything. She's going to put a positive spin on it. <laughs> she is. She probably looked at it. She's like, did you murder your wife? 100% like that. We got to find the clip. I bet you it sounds just, <laughs> just fucking like that. Did you kill Lacey, Scott? <laughs> Obviously, Scott said no. <laughs> no, he, Diane. He said he never even hit her. He never had another affair, which is not true. That's not true. He said he told the police about the affair at the very first interview, which is super lie because that interview was taped. <laughs> He said he told Lacey about Taking the... Taking another shot. I'm stressed <laughs> out. He... Where was I? He said he told Lacey about the fair in early December. Which he is I, a sociopath. Like, yes. I have decided. He is 100% sociopath. I also think so. I still don't be- believe he told Lacey at all. Uh, oh, yeah. No, me neither. She was pregnant. She would have killed him. Murdered him. I think Lacey would have told her parents or one of her friends. Absolutely. Well, but then again... She didn't tell anyone about Before. Janet. Like, and she knew about that, which is That's who what, she walked in on him with, right? Yes. She never mentioned that to anyone before. That was yeah. When that came out, that was news to everyone. But we know she knew, which was one yeah. of the big arguments that comes up is there's no way you told Lacey because she would have told her mom. But maybe but not. She did not tell her mom about Janet. Whatever. He also said that Lacey wasn't angry <laughs> about the affair when he told her. As she is fully pregnant, she's not going to be mad. Yeah, he said that she wasn't happy about it, but there wasn't any angry arguments or anything. His eight-month pregnant wife was not at all angry about the fact that he had a girlfriend. Okay. Also, on national television, 
he says that he never loved Amber. But Amber's watching this. Oh my <laughs> God, this poor girl. He's like, I never even loved Amber. Lacey knew it wasn't. It's not what you're making it out to be. Oh, oh <laughs> my God. If I were Amber, I'd be calling them immediately for my fucking sit down with Diane Sawyer. <laughs> like, I will blow your spot up, you motherfucker. <laughs> Oh my! She had him around her daughter. Yeah, and now he's like they were playing house. Like yeah. you, oh, oh my god, that poor girl. Yeah, I feel terrible for her. Holy fuck! How's it already been an hour? I don't know, but I don't. I I need to know how this ends. <laughs> okay, so Amber sure did call him. Like, what the fuck did you just say on TV? Oh my god light his ass up and of course he came up with an excuse like they cut just, out a bunch of yeah, pieces they, the edit she then pressed him again about the polygraph he then called the private company and asked about confidentiality then he set up a meeting to sell his home and called america's most wanted <laughs> like called america's most wanted to see if they could run a segment to find who murdered Lacey or who like the he call like of- he Goes from doing nothing to doing way too much. Like the call is coming from inside the house. You are on Good Morning. You're (laughs) America's Most Wanted. It's gonna be a photo of you. (laughs) They're coming for you. You fucking douche. Oh my god. He then phones his parents and said that the DA called his lawyer to offer him a deal. If Scott takes them to Lacey's body, they won't kill him. So he's saying the DA called his lawyer to say they won't. They won't do the death penalty if you take them to Lacey's body. He then said that his lawyer had to tell him about the deal. Like, he legally has to tell him that a deal was offered, but that probably probably means they have nothing to go off of if they need him to show them stuff. He's like, they have nothing if they're trying to make a deal like this. I Turns out, you'll be shocked. There was never actually a deal. No way. He made the whole fucking thing up. Here. What? Scott Peterson <laughs> lied? But this was like a 15-second conversation between McAllister and the DA, basically saying if Scott can at least give Lacey a nice burial, he might avoid having the needle in his arm. To which Scott spun that he had gotten a deal. He just made up this whole fucking lie. Also, America's Most Wanted did run a segment, and it was highly critical of Scott, so that backfired. (laughs) He plans this whole thing, and they're like, this Uh, motherfucker did it. Okay, (laughs) well... Don't bother looking for anyone. We know where he is. Yeah. We're just waiting for this to come out. At this point, the detectives plan to go to the DAs to see if they can open a case against Scott to stop him from leaving the country after. Like, I can't believe he is not arrested yet. They have nothing. Oh, my God. This is insane. You can't just arrest people. I know. But, like, fine. He lied under oath. So, they are essentially very panicked to try and see if they can open it case against him after hearing scott was making plans to get rid of Mackenzie, the dog so like he's oh he's leaving he and he's not leaving. coming back yeah but you can't like open a case against him and then not have enough and arrest him and have him get out on bail because then you're fucked there's not then you look stupid yeah however on january 29th they heard a call between scott and his boss where scott's boss did ask if scott was going to be in mexico for the upcoming work meeting so they're like okay He's not fleeing, at the very least. He is going there for a very certain reason. Scott called the police that evening about the media outside his house with bullhorns and rattling his gates. So they're Mm -hmm. all over him now. Good, stupid fucker. Scott told the detective that he missed Lacey and he was losing it. And the detective was like, listen, we both know what happened to Lacey. And Scott is still playing dumb. He's like, what do you mean? What happened to Lacey? Like, do you know what happened to Lacey? And the detective is like, you have to stop. You like, know what happened to Lacey. You need to just come in and tell us. God. So, like, they're doing this to him, and he's like, you know what happened? Like, what do you mean we both know? Do you know something? Like, yeah, I know that you I did. I know you did it. <laughs> Things are not looking great. Oh, my God. Straight up sociopath. Like, this is insane. It's wild. By the end of January, Scott had successfully sold Lacey's car and bought himself a 2002 truck. Now, remember, this is 2003. This is essentially a, a brand, brand new, new car truck. for him. Police had found out about Scott's two other affairs that I had mentioned in part one because I still had no idea about that. How crazy you could sell that. What if there was still some kind of evidence in there? They did release it. I mean, I guess you're right. Oh, my God. That's their fault. So now they know about the other two affairs because, I mean, he was telling them he had never cheated on Lacey before. We already knew that was a lie. They don't know that's a lie. So now they're like, okay, this fucking motherfucker. 
Scott's sister Anne had seen a pair of screw back one carat diamond earrings at a pawn shop and told the police, but the police never followed up on that. Which is for sure one of the pieces that Lacey had been wearing that day. Okay, so like I said, which at this point, after Lacey's family had went through her jewelry, they determined those earrings are the only piece missing. Mm -hmm. So not all the jewelry Scott said she had been wearing that day, but she was wearing those earrings. They're actively missing. His sister Anne said she saw them at a pawn shop and they never followed up on it. But also, diamond earrings aren't. At a pawn shop, yeah. Yeah. It's not One the craziest thing to see. No. But you think they would be checking on anything. What do I happen to my diamond earrings? I used to have a pair. I've actually had two pairs. I've Did lost you? them both. <laughs> Maybe that. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? I don't know how I got an engagement ring. I lose <laughs> all the jewelry. I've kept this for a hot minute. They, went, they also went back and interviewed Lacey's friends again, where now, knowing that Scott was a serial cheater, they had some different perspectives. They said they always loved Scott because he did put up with a lot of little things with Lacey. Like, she was a big, big talker. She talked all the time. They remember at a party, Scott went to the bathroom to try and get a small break from the conversation. And Lacey just followed him and talked to him through the door. And he still just entertained her conversations. I do that to Phil all the time. (laughs) Dude, you like go outside to smoke a cigarette. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll come. He's trying to get the fuck away from you. He needs a break. He does it to me sometimes. So they thought, like, that was, like, very nice of him to, like, just entertain her like that. Like, he could have easily said, like, shut the fuck up. We need to, like, not talk for a couple minutes. He never did that. I always say I need to decompress. (laughs) Lacey would also order him around a lot in front of their friends, and oh. Scott never complained. But then they were like, maybe it's not so great that they never fought. Like, he yeah, is probably no, building just resentment. it's boiling inside of him. Like, Scott, change the music, go change the stereo, go do this, go do, in front of, like, their People. friends. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. They recall Lacey agreeing for a super in-depth sonogram because Scott wanted to make sure there were no birth defects, and if there were some defects, they would have to consider abortion. He really did not want a child. No, her friends were fairly confident that Scott never wanted kids and that the abortion idea was most likely brought up by him. Yeah. Knowing how badly Lacey wanted a baby, I'm sure she wouldn't have cared. They also did not know about Janet, even though Lacey knew about that affair. Like I said, worth mentioning because maybe she would not have told anyone about it. I think there was like Amber. stuff going on behind closed doors in this marriage. Probably. I'm sorry. Like, I would light that motherfucker up. There is no way. Once, you both maybe. secretly fucking hate each other, basically, <laughs> is what I'm getting at. There has got to be so much resentment. There has to be. Like, there can't be a lot of love there at the end. Especially if Scott didn't want a family. Yeah, and that's he didn't all want a family. Wants. You're pregnant. You're preparing everything for this family. I think she's she out. loved him, but he, that was probably very annoying for her to deal with. That he could, he actively yeah. did not want a baby. And he was, like, not holding other people's babies. Like, But also... What the fuck is your deal? You gotta talk about that before you get married to someone. <laughs> he probably fucking lied. He was trying, he was pretending to be, I don't know why he was so. I guess, but people also change their minds. <laughs> Maybe they don't. Sometimes people grow up and change. <laughs> I am not one of them. Oh um, my God, what? What? What movie am I thinking? Oh, fucking Bridesmaids. You know, I think we're constantly changing all the time. Maybe not at all. Maybe not at all. I think sometimes, you know, you are who you are and that's who you'll always be. (laughs) That was exactly what that conversation was like. (sighs) On January 30th, there was a possible sighting of Lacey in Washington. A pregnant woman had shown up at a gas station with no jacket. And when the clerk asked, remember, this is January in Washington. It's It's fucking cold. And when the clerk asked why, she said she had been kidnapped at gunpoint. The clerk waited around a month to call the police. What the fuck? Don't what? you watch Good Morning America? She only called the police once she saw pictures of Lacey. It was determined that the woman was not Lacey, but it did show that Scott was not in a hurry to go to Washington to help find and identify that woman. As he never made plans to go there, even though Lacey's mother had reached out to him, she hates him, but she's like, we should go to Washington and try and see if this is actually Lacey. He was like, right. I don't want to. Like, why would you not want to go? I would be on the first flight. Yes. Your wife might be alive. In Maybe danger. Maybe go check that out. Yeah. January 31st, Lacey's family asked the detective to ask Scott for some of Lacey's things back because they were becoming paranoid Scott was going to get rid of all of her stuff. A warranted concern. Mm-hmm. He had already sold her car. Also that day, Scott calls Amber to ask her to accompany him to a polygraph the next day at 11 a.m. Police actually confirmed that the appointment was for 9 a.m., so he never had intentions of having Amber there when he actually took it. Amber called the police to ask for an undercover escort to the polygraph, and the police told her to not go at all. Yeah. 
He then called her back and asked if she, if she really thought that they would continue a relationship because he wasn't going to take the test if they weren't going to be together anyway because he was only doing it for her. Uh, okay, well. And he also refused to say her name or any other specific things in case the test got leaked to the media. So he's saying, like, I will take this test. I'm not going to say your name. I'm not going to say my name. I'm not going to say anything directly related to this case that could have people thinking it was me. Because he's, like, taking this test privately. He's going to give Amber the results. That's it. He's not doing this for anything else. Then the next morning at 8.30 a.m., Scott called Amber and asked if she could meet him in 30 minutes. She's obviously pissed. She thinks this polygraph is at 11. He's calling her at 8.30, like, can you meet me at this place in 30 minutes? She's like, what the no, fuck is your problem? I'm kill you. Burkini instead was waiting in an unmarked car near the polygraph office, and Scott noticed and confronted him. And while he's confronting him, the detective is like, is it true that McAllister, your lawyer, fired you as a client? Which Scott hadn't heard yet. Huh. But apparently was going around the media that McAllister did, in fact, drop Scott as a client. Scott then stormed away, but still appeared emotionless. He then called Amber and accused her of telling the police about the polygraph, so he didn't take it. Which they knew because they wiretapped his phone. Correct. She said she wanted him to take one with the police, and he said that that was literally not an option. He's like, you need to realize that's never going to happen. At this point, the police tell Amber she needs to cut off contact with him. Because it could become detrimental to the case at this point. Yeah. After Scott gave Amber the name of the man who would administer the polygraph, Detective Burkini called him instead. And the man basically said, yes, they are confidential. Even with a subpoena, it wouldn't be unlikely that the record of this test would be destroyed. So it is very confidential. He's like, you won't get this even if you try. He said he had an appointment today, but wouldn't say who. But the man canceled because his girlfriend wouldn't come with him and that a woman called twice to see if a man had taken a test that morning. So this is all I didn't up that Amber was actively trying to see if he took it, that Scott actually was going to take it, or he had made an appointment. But I can't believe that's like, how is that legal to do? Like, it's not like you have doctor-patient confidenti- confidentiality. <laughs> I don't know. Like, how can you, I mean, I guess unless they don't ask him those questions. That's what he's saying. He's not going to. He won't do any questions about the case. He won't do any questions. But then what's the point? There is no point. That's why Amber was pissed okay. about it. So he said the man never showed up. But then he, even that he wouldn't do. No. Like, no. so Amber wasn't even going to get the answer she wanted regardless. So the man who was supposed to administer the, administer the test said that the test requires a witness just because the results have to matter to someone. If Scott doesn't care, then there isn't going to be any pressure. And the test needs pressure to be accurate. So it's interesting. He wasn't also inviting Amber to be aren't reliable. Exactly. He wasn't inviting Amber to be nice. He sort of needed her to take this test at all. Yeah. Because he clearly doesn't care. Yeah. But if he thinks Amber cares, it's gonna put him in the right frame of mind for it to actually work. Quote I don't work. Think it they would never work, work for him because he's, he's a sociopath. sociopath. At the end of the conversation, the man said he wouldn't polygraph Scott Peterson. He did not know it was Scott Peterson, I think. Oh. At yeah. this point. He told Scott to take it with law enforcement and reminded him. <laughs> Can you imagine thinking you're just doing like some willy nilly polygraph and Scott Peterson walks in? <laughs> like, oh, no. On no, his no. own accord. That's like, not uh, what we're doing I don't think so. Above my pay grade there, buddy. So he told Scott to take it with law enforcement and reminded him that a congressman took a private polygraph test and it did little to prove him innocent, also, which is another really big case. Huh. You ever heard of the Sh- um, Chandra Levy case? The congressman who, like, oh, I his feel like it ended up missing. Sounds familiar. It's that what they're talking about. By February, police had their theory of what happened to Lacey, but there was no way to list it as a homicide yet because there was no body and no evidence even alluding to a crime scene. So the police theory that they're trying to prove, they believe what happened to Lacey was a, they say, quote, soft kill. Essentially, she was killed in a way that wouldn't leave much muscle evidence, strangled, poisoned, something yeah. like that, due to the fact that there were only two drops of blood, two tiny drops of blood, and Scott only had one small unexplained scrape on his knuckles. This also leads them to believe that Lacey wasn't aware of what was happening to her because there is not evidence of a struggle on Scott. They then think Scott brought a tarp inside, wrapped her in it, and then loaded her body in the back of his truck when he loaded up the tarped umbrellas, because it would be a Mm -hmm. similar shape, around 9.30, and set Mackenzie free with her leash on and left to go to his warehouse. There, he attaches homemade lankers, homemade anchors to Lacey's body and loaded her body into the boat to dump in the bay. They think he had no intentions of being seen or saying he went there because he has zero use of his phone the whole the whole time he's there. Mm-hmm. He's not on his phone at all. 
Then they think when he realizes enough people saw him, he decides to change his story from golfing to fishing. With This is when he places a call to Lacey saying exactly yeah. where he is. And then goes with that story instead of the golfing one. Then he got home, laid the tarp out, spilled the gas can on it to cover any smell or evidence. This is what they're thinking around this time. Scott calls Amber again and they discuss the polygraph alone. Amber refuses to accompany him to a private one unless Detective Burkini is there and he takes one at the station. He tells Amber that they have no future together then because that's not an option. <laughs> because I will surely get caught. Yes. The police just spend this month doing the same stuff, interviewing the same people, watching old interviews Scott did on TV, anything to try and move this case past this lull that it's in. They continue to search the bay, but experts said with the currents, it's possible Lacey's body could be super far away now, oh if that's God. what they did with it. They consulted an expert to take into account Lacey's weight, the anchors, and the current to try and see if there was an area Lacey would most likely be at this time. So like, all right, then we need to do some mm-hmm. fucking math here. On February 10th, Lacey's mom called Scott and begged him to call the station with a disguised voice and just tell them where to find Lacey. It was her due date, and they just desperately wanted her home, and they know that he knows where she is. Scott called her back, denied everything. Lacey's family had a candlelight vigil on the 10th to mark Lacey's due date. On the 13th, Scott's family hosts a press conference saying they are reaching out to hospitals hoping that Lacey had been taken to a hospital to give birth. Well, obviously not. Scott was at neither of these events. Not Lacey's parents or his own parents. He went to none of them. The detectives got a second search warrant on February 18th to basically search everything again. Scott had two duffel bags packed to take with him since the search would take about a day. Inside the duffel bag was over $2,000 in cash, wine, Viagra, and his wedding ring that he wasn't wearing. He's packing all this on a one-day trip. Viagra. You're going to need that? Also, how old are you that you already need fucking Viagra? Like a lot of Viagra, I think. It's because he's stressed and can't get it up because he killed his fucking wife? Probably. While searching, they didn't really find anything outwardly incriminating, just weird. Um, Scott sort of had, like, stuff everywhere. It was a mess. Connor's room was full of stuff. Like, he was using it for storage. So, obviously, he wasn't that upset. No. Amy, Lacey's sister, was able to identify the pieces of outfit Lacey wore the day before she went missing. They were all inside and balled up and shoved in with the clean clothes in the dresser, which was weird to them because that's not not how Lacey operated. She wouldn't just ball up a nice maternity shirt, and she definitely would not put her dirty clothes back in with clean clothes. These clothes were missing from the initial inventory they did, so they were not there when they went there the first time. They found a planner with, um, quote, important date for A, written in March 28, 2003. So he's, like, planning things with Amber. They also discovered a buck knife and two boat wheels with reddish-brown stains on them at his storage container. While searching the Peterson residence, the Scott, the cops decided to take funny pictures of themselves wearing a crown from one of Scott's old Halloween costumes, which would come back to bite them in the ass at the trial. Come on. Are you come joking? Come on. Why are we... Some shit I would do if I was a cop. <laughs> For sure. Just having a gay old time. Literally. Just going through people's shit. (laughs) Oh, my God. Wow. Why would you do that? Cops are fucking dumb sometimes. They are dumb. So while the police are searching his home, Scott calls Dish to cancel their cable. The cable is in Lacey's name, which if you know anything about cable, it's impossible to do anything with cable if it's not in your actual literal name. Yes. The lady working remembers Scott calling himself. We Mich- should be able to if you have if you're married and have her social security number. Oh, maybe. Should I just know it's like a huge deal with us. Like my mom can't call for the cable about anything because I won't answer her. The lady working remembers Scott calling himself Mr. Peterson. He said he was moving and that's why he needed to cancel it. When they offered to just transfer the service over, he said he was moving out of the country. And he was actually calling to cancel it because he had subscribed to two porn channels just days after Lacey went missing and didn't want the police to find out. Yeah, you sick fuck. What? Yes. <laughs> I can't. This man is a fucking moron. Yep. We're almost done. Let's put it lightly. In another interview with Ann Bird, Scott's sister, who he was staying with frequently in Berkeley... She revealed that when the family went to Disneyland in November, that Jackie had confided in Anne that Lacey and Scott had been having problems again, implying that they previously had had problems, which nobody else had mentioned. Anne also observed that Scott seemed to be portraying the perfect husband, doing all the stuff for Lacey, but it seemed sort of, like, empty, if that makes sense. Like, he was just doing it so other people could see him doing it. Right. That's how Anne described it, anyway, after Lacey was already missing. So it is possible she's thinking back on this and thinking way too far into it. 
This is from that book that leans heavily bias against Scott, so I just feel the need to point that out. Yeah. He was waiting hand and foot for Lacey in Disney World. Whether he was doing it for show, we'll never know. We will literally never know. And also observed Scott to seem to be a heavy drinker when he stayed at her house. He came home one night when the babysitter was there and bought the ingredients to make a drink from Sex in the City and was trying to hang out with the babysitter. Oh my God, he's such a fucking creeper. He's ball and Anne said that just seems weird. Like his slime. wife and son were actively missing and you're trying to like woo the babysitter with alcohol. In mid-February, police received a weird tip from an airline that said Lacey had called around December 22nd or 23rd to ask about booking plane tickets to San Diego on Christmas Day. The worker said Scott could be heard yelling in the background about using miles and Lacey telling him, like, why don't we save our airline miles and not use them for tickets that cost $98? Like, it's a waste of miles if we can afford it. Lacey also asked about tickets to Mexico, but was advised that she would need a doctor's note to fly that late in her pregnancy. Nothing ever came of this because the reservation was booked in a way where Lacey and Scott could pay at the counter. So there's no way to actually prove any of this. It could have been anyone calling in anyone's name. No way to prove it. But that's just weird. By early March, it was concluded that the hair found in the pliers in Scott's warehouse was a match to the hair found in Lacey's hairbrush. However, the hair did not have the root attached, so it was sort of impossible to prove. Logistically, that hair could have been from 1 in 600 women in the Modesto area. But... It was a match for Lacey's. It was also in March that Lacey's disappearance was classified as a homicide. Well, yeah. Finally. Detectives released a statement that they believed Lacey was a victim of violent crime and made different requirements for the previous $500,000 reward as they were now looking for information related to her location and recovery, not her return. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Scott's circle was shrinking. Scott's circle was shrinking. His friends really did not want to be around him. 60 to 70% of his clients refused to see him anymore. Yeah. You think you killed somebody. Yeah. The police fielded a slew of crazy leads, like some woman who claims to have went to a bar and Scott came up to her and asked her if he wanted to, if she wanted to have an affair and then said that he wanted to kill his wife and asked her how she would get rid of a body. And she said that she thought he was joking. So she told him, of course, she would weigh it down and throw it in the ocean. Like just a ton of calls like this. Like how convenient that you had this exact conversation. Right. So, like, nothing came of those because it was obviously just people looking for attention. This all changes on April 13th, 2003, when a couple walking their dog at San Francisco Bay saw something horrifying. Here it comes. And that's the end of part two. Oh, you're a piece of shit. (laughs) It's the perfect breaking point. Oh, my God. I put my phone down. I was ready. You're ready to zone back in? God damn it. Well, you can't because that's that. (laughs) okay and we'll see you next week that's all i got that was a lot longer than i thought yeah oh Oh, well well. (laughs) takes place for my shit the last whatever i don't fucking know what day it all averages out yeah you're fine you guys are fine (laughs) all right well so next week will be the conclusion of this case that's also going to be a longer episode, just so you know. Buckle up for that. Hopefully, if you're on the Patreon, it's out a little earlier. So it's 8.15 here. Yeah, I'm to go home. <laughs> so. My family can't live without me. No, they can't. You're the glue that holds everyone together. I don't understand how this happened in my life, honestly. <laughs> me either. It's the other the day, I was too. like, I'm a stay-at-home mom right now, <laughs> basically. You really are. I'm like, I, I work tomorrow. That'll my only day working this week. <laughs> my son is no longer in summer daycare. Oh, yeah, because he hated it. I'm like, I'm a stay-at-home mom <laughs> for an almost 10-year-old. <laughs> it's like, am I that's a, a dream. What? I know. I'm not complaining. I've watched so much Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> God, that's so fucking great. I'm like, would it be that bad to get COVID? <sighs> my life really wouldn't change much. <laughs> Both my parents almost died, so outlook is bleak. If I get it... This is going to be one of those things people play back. Like, remember when she said she wanted this so bad? But also, I want to say it out loud right now for all our listeners. Madison said, if she dies, I get all her new bedroom furniture. So I did say that. You may have it. Thank you. I bequeath it all to you. Thank you. I love the word bequeath. Me too. I think instead of taking I think I'm just going to move in. Like, I'll just. That's a good idea. It'll be like nothing changed. Yeah. I'll take your car. I'll just take. I'll just. <laughs> Very organic. I'll just swap. Just <laughs> fill on in. There will be no. It'll be fine. That will be fine. We'll all heal much easier that way. 
I like this idea. It makes me feel better about my impending death. I bet your mom will like it, too. <laughs> I'm All a little right. nicer than you, so. Kind of, which is odd. Could work out. <laughs> Depends on the situation. Yeah, it does. That's true. That's true. All right. See you guys next week for the final episode. Woo woo. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. As always, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at AlmostPod if you'd like to interact with us and talk about the cases. You can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash AlmostPod. It's a monthly subscription where you get early access to two-parters, shout-outs, bonus episodes. You can email us at almostpod at gmail.com. Questions, comments, concerns, corrections, compliments. Mm-hmm. If, <laughs> always compliments. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Please be sure to subscribe. That way, every week when we drop a new episode, it will automatically download for you to listen to. You can also give us a five-star rating and write us a review and let us know what you think. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.